Hello again, this is God Hill. This is video number two, integration. This is part two. We're going to use integration to find the electric field of a disk. Okay, so suppose we have a disk of charge like this. It's got a surface charge density sigma. Okay, this is a disk, remember, is when the charge is smeared entirely on the surface of the disk, not just along the edges. And we'll say that this disk has a radius r. And I want to find the electric field a distance h above the center of the disk. All right. Again, we write the electric field is equal to the integral of all the little electric fields created by all the little points. And the electric field of each point is equal to k dq over r cubed r vec. In class we talked about the fact that dq in this case is equal to sigma times little r dr d theta. We're working in polar coordinates here because this is a circle. Uh, the r in r dr d theta actually belongs to d theta and that makes the units work out right. Whenever we have d theta we always need radius as well. And the radius we use when we integrate over a disk is little r, the coordinate. Um, r vec is equal to minus, again as we talked in class, minus r r hat plus h z hat. So if we draw a little picture of a sample point on the disk like that, that's r vec. Okay. To get from this source point to the target point, I need to go back to the origin. All right. Now, r hat, remember, is a unit vector which points away from the axis of the disk. So negative r hat points towards the axis. So if I want to get from the source to the target, I first can go from the source to the origin by moving a distance r in the negative r hat direction, and then I move up in the z hat direction a distance h. If, some of, if the notation isn't clear to you, I refer to you to your class notes from Friday. Um, all right, and the length of this vector is equal to the square root of r squared plus h squared. That's how polar coordinates work, or you can also notice that this is a right angle right here, which makes this a right triangle. And so we can use the Pythagorean theorem. If we put all that together, we get that the electric field is equal to the double integral. This will be a double integral because there are two integration variables, r and theta, of k sigma r dr d theta over r squared plus h squared to the 3 halves power times minus r r hat plus h z hat. And that's the setup we, we had that in class. Now again, we have, just as we had with the line, we have a sum of two vectors which we can distribute over and then split the integral up into two pieces. Before we do that, I forgot the limits of integration. The limits of integration for the for r, little r, little r runs from the center, 0, to the radius, which is capital R, and theta is going to run around the circle from 0 to 2 pi. That is 360 degrees all the way around. So we split this electric field up into two integrals, 0 to 2 pi, 0 to r, k sigma r squared, because there are two factors of r, 1, 2, there's a minus sign that comes from that from the vector, uh, dr d theta r hat over r squared plus h squared to the 3 halves, plus the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to r, k sigma r h dr d theta over r squared plus h squared to the 3 halves, and I forgot the z hat. Okay, 
The next step is to pull out what's constant. Again, we're going to assume that sigma is a constant of the integration, that is the charge is spread out evenly on the disk. And in two-dimensional integrals like this, as long as we don't have any terms where the two integration variables r and theta are added together or subtracted or something like that, um, and we don't here, then we can normally separate double integrals out into a pair of single integrals which are um, which are multiplied together. That is, we find all the terms which depend on r and put them in the r integral, and all of the theta terms which can put them in the theta integral. And we can pull all the constants completely out of both integrals. So let's look at this first one here. We get negative k sigma. We're assuming that k and sigma are constant. The r integral is the integral from 0 to capital R of r squared dr over r squared plus h squared to the 3 halves. Okay. Um, d theta, of course, does not depend on r. And r hat does not depend on r because r hat, the vector which points away from the center, does not depend on how far away you are from the center. It always points away. But if we do the theta integral, then we notice that r hat does depend on where you are in the circle. If you imagine that you're on the disk like this, then if theta is equal to 0, r hat points in this direction. But when theta is equal to 2 pi, or not 2 pi, pi over 2, r hat points in this direction. Down here, at 3 pi over 2, r hat points in this direction. So r hat is a function of theta, and so we can't pull it out of the theta integral. However, if we look at the other unit vector in the second integral, the z hat is a constant, does not depend on angle, because z hat always points up, regardless of where you are on the disk. Okay, So if we look at constants here, we've got k, sigma, h, z hat. They all come completely out of the integral. k, sigma, h, z hat. The r integral is r dr over r squared plus h squared to the 3 halves power times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of just d theta. Okay. Now normally in these cases the theta integrals are easier to do. We can see that very clearly. If we look at this integral, the integral of d theta from 0 to 2 pi, that's equal to theta evaluated from 0 to 2 pi, and that's just equal to 2 pi. That's a very common theta integral that we run into. This integral, the integral of r hat d theta, what that is is that's the sum of all the little r hats pointing in all the different directions around the circle. Okay, And if we add all of these up, maybe I'll use this symbol, if we add up all of these vectors together, we can see that the sum of all these vectors is going to be 0 because every vector here has its opposite included in the sum. And whenever you add a vector and its opposite together, we end up with 0. So that means that this integral, the integral of r hat d theta, is 0, which means that the first term is also equal to 0. So that means we don't have to do this r integral at all, this r integral at all, which is good, because it looks messy. We do have to do this integral in the z hat, however, but if we look at it, we see that this looks very much like the, an integral that we did for the line, where we had x dx over x squared plus a squared to the 3 halves power. Okay, And we already know what that integral is. Oops, I did that again. So e hat, uh, e vec, sorry, is equal to k sigma h z hat. And then this integral, r dr over r squared plus h squared to the 3 halves power, that integral evaluates to minus 1 over the square root of r squared plus h squared, evaluated from 0 to capital R, times 2 pi. And then if we substitute r and 0 into minus 1 over the square root of r squared plus h squared, we get 2 pi k sigma h z hat, 
if we substitute r in, we get minus 1 over the square root of capital R squared plus h squared, minus negative, or plus, 1 over the square root of 0 plus h squared. OK, that gives us 2 pi k sigma h z hat 1 over h minus 1 over the square root of r squared plus h squared. And that's the electric field of a disk. with constant sigma. That's our answer. Yay! Woo so forth. <laughs> now, one thing we might like to do with this is ask, in particular, the reason I introduced this in class is I want to know what is the electric field of an infinite disk? An infinite disk is one where the radius goes to infinity. If radius goes to infinity, then the second term in the sum here becomes 1 over infinity. 1 over infinity is just 0. And so that goes away. We're left with all of this, 2 pi k sigma h z hat times 1 over h. That means this factor of h cancels this factor of h, and we get that the electric field of an infinite disk is equal to 2 pi k sigma z hat. And the remarkable thing about this is that the electric field only depends on, if we ignore everything that isn't a constant, the only thing that the electric field depends on is sigma, that is the charge density. It does not depend on distance. You can get as far away as you like from an infinite disk and the electric field stays constant. And an infinite disk, well, an infinite disk, the, using the word disk here is actually kind of silly because disk implies that this is a circle. But a circle is only defined by its boundaries, and if it's infinite, how do you know it's a circle? It could just as easily be a square or anything else. And so this is the field of an infinite sheet that we discussed before, and we talked about the fact that the electric field is constant. And now we've proven that the electric field is indeed constant. That is, it doesn't depend on distance from the sheet. That's all I have to say about integration. Uh, take a look at the homework problems, which give you some different geometries. See what you can do. The most important part about all of this, the part that I'm most interested in, is being able to write the integrals down. Doing the integrals is secondary, but it is a skill that you're expected to know in your general education. Um, but I will focus primarily on your ability to write integrals. That's all for now. See you later.